Here's another example. For our domain, we're looking at what makes the denominator equal to zero. One way you can remember that is domain and denominator both start with D. I'm taking my denominator and just setting it equal to zero, and I want to try and solve this for X. Well, this is a quadratic equation. It doesn't have an X term, so I could use the square root method. If I go on with this, then I'm going to have x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 16. This is going to have complex solutions. And since we're talking about the graphs of these, complex solutions don't show up on the graph. There are no real solutions for this. There are no real numbers that would make our denominator equal to zero. That means our domain, as far as the real numbers, is all of the real numbers which is negative infinity to infinity. Now let's think about our x-intercepts. We're going to take the numerator and set that equal to zero. And we can just solve this for x. So we could factor it or we can just solve it this way. We end up with x equals one. So we would have our x-intercept as the point one zero. And that's the only place that the graph is going to cross or touch the x-axis. Then last of all for our vertical asymptotes, for this one, because we didn't get any real solutions when we tried to find numbers to exclude from the domain, that means that there are no vertical asymptotes. Now let's look at the graph for this one. Notice when I put this in my calculator, I put parentheses around both the numerator and the denominator because they both had two terms. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be getting the right graph from this. This graph looks a lot different than the other ones we've done. That's partly because there are no vertical asymptotes. So we don't see any of that behavior where we've got something going up towards positive infinity or going down towards negative infinity. We just have a more flat graph but we do see the x-intercept, which is at the point one zero. That's right there. And I can do a trace and see that even better. So there's my x-intercept. What this means is that as the graph goes this way, the graph might get closer to the x-axis, but it's never actually going to touch it. And the same way on this side. Let's look at one more example for this. In this one, our function is in factored form on both the top and the bottom. That's going to make it a little bit easier for us to solve things. For our domain, we want to see what makes the denominator equal to zero. So really what we're doing is taking the denominator and setting it equal to zero. That's going to give us two solutions, x equals one and x equals three. Both of these have to be excluded from the domain. If we want to write our domain in interval notation, we would have three intervals from negative infinity to one, from one to three, and from three to infinity. And next let's look at our x-intercepts. For this we're looking at what makes the numerator equal to zero. Since this one's a little bit more complicated, I'm going to take my whole numerator and just set it equal to zero. That's going to give me two solutions, one at x equals negative five and another one at x equals one. And normally I would say that both of these are x-intercepts, but there's a problem here with the x equals one because that was one of the numbers that had to be excluded from the domain. So that one can't be an x-intercept. That means our only x-intercept is at negative five. Well, that's one point on the graph, and that's the only place the graph is going to cross or touch the x-axis. When we look at our vertical asymptotes for this, the fact that x equals one showed up both when we found our domain and when we were looking for our x-intercepts means that the x equals one didn't count as an x-intercept. It's also not going to give us a vertical asymptote. So our only vertical asymptote is going to be at x equals three. Then the question is, what actually is happening at x equals one? It looks like we should have an x-intercept there, but the function's not defined there because that was something that made the denominator equal to zero. 
So what actually happens there is that we have a hole in the graph. Any time that you get the same number that makes both the numerator and the denominator equal to zero, then you end up with a hole in the graph at that point. And if we go back and look at our function, we can see why that's happening. We've got a common factor on the top and the bottom of this. One thing about these, though, is you don't ever want to actually cancel these common factors out. You want to leave them there because to get the graph of this actual function, we have to count the fact that there's a hole in the graph at that point. Now let's look at the graph of this function. And notice how many extra sets of parentheses I put in here. Just because my numerator had two factors, I went ahead and put extra parentheses around those. And this I had to do to make the graph come out right. I also put an extra set of parentheses around my denominator. If your denominator is in factored form, if it has more than one factor, you have to put in those extra parentheses. Looking at this graph, I can see now that it only has one vertical asymptote. If I had written down that there was an, a vertical asymptote at x equals 1, I'd be able to see from the graph that that behavior I'm expecting isn't happening close to x equals 1. It is happening on either side of x equals 3, though. I can also see my x-intercept over here at negative 5, so my graph is crossing the x-axis there. The one thing the calculator doesn't do a good job of showing you is holes in the graph, but you can actually verify that there's a hole in the graph at that point. If I do a trace for this graph, and if I put in 1 for x, what it's going to give me is a blank for my y. That means that the function's not defined there. I would also get the same thing if I put in 3 for x, because the function wasn't defined there either. We could see what's happening close to x equals 1. For example, if I put in 0.9 for x, I could see a point that's close to where that hole is. So this is 0.9, and my y value is close to negative 3. If I put in a value that's close to 1, but bigger than 1, like 1.1, now I'm getting a point that's a little bit on the other side of that hole. Notice for this one, the y value is a little bit less than negative 3. So I could make a guess from this that my hole is actually at the point 1, negative 3.